attention. She was young, she was innocent, and she was stunningly beautiful. And the first thought that went through my mind was, when I saw her, this is the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. She was luminescent. The goodness in Dorothy just glowed. It just came out of her. I walked down the street with her once, and people's heads were like whiplashed. I mean, she's just, she was staggering. She was so beautiful. Dorothy Stratton was the embodiment of the Hollywood dream. Plucked out of a Dairy Queen in Canada, she first found fame as a Playboy playmate. But her beauty transcended the pages of the centerfold, and Dorothy was on the verge of becoming a movie star. Then, in a grisly tragedy that sent shockwaves through Hollywood, Stratton was found dead. Our evidence, uh, uncovered at the scene, uh, leads us to believe at this time that it was a murder-suicide. The people who knew and loved Dorothy would never get over the tragedy of her death. And her story continues to linger in the popular consciousness. The 1983 film Star 80 brought Dorothy's story to the big screen. Suddenly, she wasn't just gossip page fodder anymore. Dorothy had become a symbol of Hollywood corruption. It's a story about lust and loss. You know, it's a story about uh, sex and death. And that both fascinates and scares people, so it's interesting. And uh, being a true story, it uh, made it even more powerful. I have this feeling about Dorothy. She's going to be a big star. There was a quality of her that I knew very well, the quality of wanting to please everybody around you, wanting to do the right thing, being overwhelmed when somebody would tell you that you were pretty or that you were good at something. And that was what enabled all these people to take advantage of her. Dorothy was the puppet in this whole thing. Everyone else were pulling the strings. Bogdanovich pulled them, Hefner pulled them, Paul Schneider pulled them. And she was just, she was very innocent in a, a den of wolves. Everyone wanted a piece of her for their own reason. It's a tragedy about a, a perfect woman and a horrible man and a series of events in which she was used and exploited for her exterior qualities. There was a darker side to it. The darker side involved a Peter, and he blamed everybody, I think, connected to her, except himself, and including me. Dorothy Stratton was a simple girl from Canada who got caught up in a treacherous rivalry between the man who discovered her and the two more powerful men who came into her life in Hollywood. But they all had the same goal, to turn Dorothy into a star. By the late 1970s, Hugh Hefner had transformed Playboy magazine into a multi-million dollar empire. For the magazine's 25th anniversary in 1978, he celebrated with one blowout after another. There were these amazing parties. A lot of the young women that came to Playboy, um, it was sort of their freedom. It was their sexual freedom. And I, I'm always kind of a scaredy cat, and I was wild. It was a pretty wild time. Playboy was looking for the perfect girl next door to be the 25th anniversary playmate. They were offering a $25,000 cash prize. In Vancouver, Canada, a small-time hustler named Paul Snyder thought Dorothy was the right girl. He just had to convince her to pose nude. She was afraid her mother would not like it, and uh, she didn't feel comfortable doing it. There was arguing going on, I recall that. Dorothy crying, you know, and Paul trying to convince her that this is right, that it'll be fine, it's not the worst thing in the world. Uh, go ahead, do it. Paul forged Dorothy's mother's signature on the photographer's permission form. She had to be told what to do, what particular pose to take. She was a natural in front of film. I can't think of anybody that I've ever photographed that come even close to her. The day after her photographs arrived at the magazine, Playboy flew Dorothy to Los Angeles. That was a big day for me. They, they flew me out that Sunday, the first time I was on an airplane. They did test shootings with me that same day. They brought me up to Hefner's mansion that same day. It was very exciting, very nerve-wracking. She had all the qualities I would 
that we're always looking for. I mean, she was the epitome of a girl next door. Uh, absolutely gorgeous in face and figure, luminescent, angelic, the sweetest person I ever knew. She lit up our room. All the corny phrases were true about Dorothy. Dorothy suddenly found herself swept into the glamorous world of Hollywood and Playboy, a place where her boyfriend, Paul Snyder, would not feel as welcome. She had not seen the world yet. And when she started to see the world and meet smarter people, more worldly people, more interesting people, uh, she outgrew him. And uh, he was not to be outgrown. He could never compete with any other movie producers because he didn't have the finances, the nice home, the cars, the connections. When a person um, knows they're inadequate and they can feel that inside, but they won't say anything and they'll try and put up a front. He probably did that. He put his best face on when really inside he was probably crying. And then because of jealousy and hatred and fear, a man, Paul Snyder, kills her. He destroys that which he loves because he couldn't have it. Maybe, you know, I think that happens a lot more than we realize in, in, in the world. Dorothy, I've got a copy of the Playboy magazine. I just want you to look at it and tell me which is your favorite picture. Which shows Dorothy the best? Um, this one. It's like, it's almost candid. It's just very me, I think. It's not a posed look. It's just natural. I like it. In August 1978, 18-year-old Dorothy Hoogstraten made her first appearance at the Playboy Mansion. I remember seeing Dorothy, and they said that she was going to be a playmate. I was a little surprised. She was completely blank, no makeup, and she was scared to death. She had just gotten off the plane. I like to say she was like a Polaroid that hadn't developed yet. She was so eager, so fragile, that I immediately felt this girl's got to be protected. I met a lot of naive girls from small towns, but not to the degree that Dorothy was. Playboy executives decided that Dorothy wasn't ready to be the 25th anniversary playmate and instead named her Miss August for the following year, 1979. She moved into the guest quarters at the Playboy Mansion and started shooting her centerfold. Back in Vancouver, her boyfriend, Paul Snyder, was afraid that he was losing his ticket to the big time. What an earache he was. He must have, must have asked me, did you hear from Dorothy or this or that, a dozen times a day. So I photographed a bunch of shots of him just to keep him quiet. I appealed to his ego, and <laughs> it worked. After nearly three months of waiting, Paul Snyder was finally allowed into the world Dorothy was already conquering. Enjoy the I can remember Paul feeling inadequate when he was at the Playboy Mansion and uh, feeling, I'm part of it now. But in reality, you're looking only through a gate. He was always a bit uncomfortable at the mansion and at the parties. He knew that he was out of his element. He just had a nasty, nasty vibe. Anything that you might say about Dorothy, the opposite was true of Paul. In other words, Dorothy made this incredible impression. Uh, everybody loved her, and almost everyone was universally put off by Paul. The only time I saw him was at the mansion. And I could see what he'd walk up to Hef. Hef would just cringe. God, I feel Hef here and I are old friends. You know, I think we even have some mutual buddies. Is uh, Telly at this bash? Telly? Savalas. Telly Savalas, he's an old pal. He was a wheeler dealer and a very obvious one. And it was already very difficult to understand until you really knew Dorothy's story, how it was possible for her to be in that relationship. On February 28, 1960, in Vancouver, Canada, Dorothy Hoogstraten was born into an unhappy marriage. Simon Hoogstraten worked as a carpenter, while Nellie looked after Dorothy and her younger son, John. Dorothy was three years old when her father left the family for another woman. When Dorothy was eight, her mother remarried and gave birth to a baby girl named Louise. But Dorothy's new stepfather had a violent temper that dominated the household. 
The day he broke John's arm, Nellie picked up her children and left him for good. There was a lot of secrets, and uh, Dorothy would tell me a lot of stuff, but the whole thing was keep it to yourself, don't bug people. You know, you could figure it out on your own. Nellie rented rooms in the homes of other families until she'd saved enough to buy a tiny house in East Vancouver. While her mother worked, Dorothy played parent. Took care of me a lot, because my mom wasn't around. Taught me how to tie my shoes. Was there for every um, school function, sports day, um, talent day. She was there. Throughout high school, the shy, awkward teenager earned straight A's. After school and on weekends, Dorothy worked at a local Dairy Queen to help her mother pay the bills. At 14, she was tall and skinny, built like a two by four. She was quiet, she kept to herself, and uh, always looked away when I talked to her or tried to discuss anything with her. She never ever looked, she never had eye contact. People at school would tease her about her lips being so big and she felt awkward. She wasn't comfortable in her own skin. And she thought she was the most ugliest duckling there ever was. She said, I'll never be beautiful. And I said, you will. And I saw this beauty in her that she didn't see. Dorothy was 17 when 26-year-old Paul Snyder walked into the Dairy Queen in 1978. He took one look at Dorothy and told his friend, that girl could make me a lot of money. Paul wanted to be recognized. There's no doubt. I'd say he was your average kid, but always aspiring to move up in life, even as a child. We would sell stamps from our home and stuff and trade with other kids and things like that. I remember that. What good kid didn't have a lemonade stand? I mean, it's the entrepreneurial spirit. When he grew up, Paul's entrepreneurial spirit led him to criminal activity. In the neighborhood where Dorothy Stratton sold ice cream, Snyder peddled flesh. They called him the Jewish pimp. He was a sneaky weasel. Just kind of popped up in the weirdest places. I told Dorothy, I said, you got to stay away from him. He's bad news. He's going to have you out in the street just like the rest of his girls. All of a sudden, this guy came into her life and was starting to come around the house, and we weren't very happy about it. He knew she was vulnerable, but unfortunately, there was no father, and uh, he was saying all the right things to her. She felt that everything that was wonderful that had happened to her happened because Paul had plucked her out of the Dairy Queen. So Paul Snyder comes along, takes her out of the Dairy Queen in Vancouver, Canada, sweeps her off to Hollywood, tells her she's going to be a big star. It's kind of the Hollywood dream, the American dream. Then Hefner, even more successful, more fatherly, comes into her life. She puts her, her trust in him. Although Hugh Hefner didn't select Dorothy as the 25th anniversary playmate, he believed that she could be a star. Dorothy changed her name to Stratton, and by 1979, Playboy had set her up with an agent and her first screen roles. I said that someone has been watching me. Dorothy had been in Hollywood for less than a year, but she was quickly adapting to her new environment. She was such a sponge. She just like <laughs> sucked up everything around her. She literally came together before our eyes. Paul tried to live up to her, and then he realized that she had outgrown him. Paul Snyder began to feel his influence with Dorothy fading. He made a move to secure his investment. She came to me very much as she might to a father and told me that she was going to marry Paul. And uh, it was difficult to respond to that. I urged her against it, but I did it gently because I really thought it would be an affront and inappropriate for me to say what I really felt. I think she married him because she felt uh, obligated to him. She wanted to do what was right. It was really important to Dorothy to be a good person. In promoting her August 1979 Playboy debut, Dorothy behaved every bit the good girl eager to please, to a point. Are you really shy, sensitive, and romantic? Yes, I'm getting over my shyness as, as uh, fast. <laughs> but I am very sensitive, and I'm very romantic. If I asked you to take off your clothes now, would you do it? No. Why not? Well, because, um, what, why? That's not romantic. 
Dorothy's unique blend of innocence and eroticism made her a perfect Playboy centerfold. Her issue flew off the newsstands, and it was clear that she would be Hugh Hefner's top choice for Playmate of the Year. Meanwhile, husband Paul Snyder was still trying to make his mark in Los Angeles in the only ways he knew how. It was Paul Snyder who actually created the Chippendale Dancers. And the fact that the Chippendale Dancers have the cuffs and collars that are exactly the same as Playboy Bunnies came directly from Paul because Dorothy was working as a bunny at the Playboy Club. I can definitely say he promoted it to the point where it took off because I was there when it happened. And, and from that point on, they faded him out. He was very bitter about it. In a pattern that would repeat itself, Paul was pushed out of Chippendales by someone with more money and power. Dorothy was his only success story in a life marked by get-rich-quick schemes gone wrong. She would become all he had at just the moment her opportunities seemed limitless. Surrounded as you are in the entertainment and magazine business by so many con men, isn't it awfully hard to live a normal life now, from now on? Well, uh, what is a normal life? Um, my, my life to me, um, I travel a lot. I'm hardly ever at home. I hardly know what a house looks like anymore. Yeah. Um, I enjoy my work very much. I'm, I get up 4 o'clock in the morning to get on movie sets. That's normal to me. I enjoy that. One year since leaving her hometown, Dorothy Stratton was becoming a star. But she still wasn't bringing in big money. She and husband Paul Snyder needed housemates to afford a rented home beside a Los Angeles freeway. Paul used Dorothy's meager earnings to buy himself a Mercedes. He brings me over and says, oh, look, star 80. He said he was going to make her star in 1980. He did. But Dorothy's star would rise even higher when she met director Peter Bogdanovich. He had stopped by the Playboy Mansion to visit Hugh Hefner, a good friend who had co-produced his latest film, St. Jack. I was standing next to Dorothy and Peter Bogdanovich just walked over and started to talk to her. And she asked him, what do you do? And he said, I'm a director. And I remember hearing that and going, she doesn't know who he is. And uh, he was charmed by that. Bogdanovich had made his mark eight years earlier with The Last Picture Show, a film that launched the career of another blonde model turned actress, Sybil Shepard. The two became lovers and Bogdanovich divorced his wife. But after making several unsuccessful Shepard vehicles, their seven-year affair ended. In 19-year-old Dorothy Stratton, Peter Bogdanovich had discovered another ingenue. She had a kind of glow, and uh, the way she talked, the way she moved, uh, her laugh. Uh, she was very smart, uh, you know, to talk to. Great to have a conversation and a great sense of humor. I mean, I just uh, uh, fell for her. Three months after their first conversation, he had written Stratton a co-starring role in his next film. We took a small part that had been in the picture and I had an idea to expand it and to put an entire plot line in, all because of her. Before long, Dorothy's working relationship with the director had become an illicit love affair. Then we went down to the beach and um, that's the first time we really kissed each other. It was just magic. And then um, I had to go back to New York, and she sent me a card. And inside, she'd written uh, the date, and then she just wrote one day since yesterday. Intimidated and suspicious, Paul Snyder could feel Dorothy slipping away, so he tightened his grip. He was very obsessed with her. He went everywhere, watched everything that she did. He was on the scene. Then I was telling Paul, yeah, you're strangling her. But this was a very deep psychological and emotional need in him because he invested everything into one relationship. The fragility that I have first seen in Dorothy grew exponentially. I was very, very worried about her. So I gave her a puppy, and she was thrilled. A week later, the puppy was dead. Dorothy had made one statement to me during this week that she had the puppy. She said, Paul thinks I love the puppy more than him. I'm sure he killed the dog. And if that wasn't a wake-up call to all of us, you know, it should have been. By March 1980, 
Stratton was in New York filming, they all laughed with Peter Bogdanovich. It was obvious that Peter had more to offer than her husband Paul, and she threw herself into a whirlwind romance with the director. She went from one man to another man who molded her, who made her who she was because she didn't have the security to know who she was by herself. And I think that that was her tragic flaw, so to speak, is that she gave over her power as a woman, but I think she was too young to even know that she had power herself. She had no mentor. She had nobody that she could really talk to. And I think Peter was very encouraging to her. And I think that she was a huge inspiration to him. Bogdanovich used details from Dorothy's real life for her character in the film. It was a scene in which we wanted her to be observed by John Ritter, who was falling in love with her from a distance, as I had. As a director, I noticed her ability to do anything. Not just saying a line, but doing things very precisely, a look, putting on a thing, turning a certain way, whatever it was. It had to be very precise. Where does one's career go from here? I mean, are you worried that you have to make it quickly? I think the acting career actually uh, can't be taken too quickly because if you rush things and you make the wrong decisions, it could, it could be over very quickly. She really wanted to pursue a career. I think part of that ambition was because she wanted to make sure her family was taken care of. She opened up my first bank account. She would put money in it uh, like once a month and to save up for braces. Dorothy was also giving money to her husband, Paul Snyder. But by now, her lawyers had him on an allowance. In another scheme to supplement his limited income, Paul built a sexual bondage chair that he planned to sell to sex shops. When the venture failed, he kept the only one he had made in his bedroom. He clung to Dorothy as his only means of support. It had been less than a year since her first appearance in Playboy but Dorothy was already in a different league. In April of 1980, Hugh Hefner named her Playmate of the Year, and she received over $100,000 in cash and prizes. And now, our 1980 Playmate of the Year, Dorothy Stratton. Dorothy, you want to come up here? Um, I would like to thank my other half, my photographer, Mario Caselli, who I practically had under contract for the last year and a half. And to half, who has made me probably the happiest girl in the world today. Thank you. During that particular day, it was clear that uh, there was trouble between her and, and Paul. She was kind of avoiding him. There's also a moment in which she is going through a book of pictures, and uh, he puts his hand on her, and she pulls it away. She would whisper to me, like, get away from here, yes, just under her breath, she, because he was bothering her. And she didn't like having him around. She didn't quite know how to cope with his overreach, constantly. He would call her 10 times a day. You could tell from her conversations and her behavior with him that she had gone, her heart had left and was somewhere else, and he was still hanging on to an illusion that maybe there was hope that he could get her back. When you see what happened to two of the people that you mentioned, Marilyn Monroe and Jean Harlow, and how their lives got messed up, does it bother you being a beautiful blonde and, and choosing the movies as your particular field? Well, I just take life day at a time. In the summer of 1980, Dorothy Stratton was wrapping up a Playboy publicity tour as Playmate of the Year. The media spotlight reached a climax at her final stop, the town where she grew up and her family still lived, Vancouver, Canada. I think my brother was a little bit shy because he has friends who are 18 years old, 17 years old, um, that said, you know, hey, your sister's in Playboy. As the first Playmate of the 80s basked in the limelight, Husband Paul Snyder received a letter from Dorothy asking for a separation. She had already closed their joint bank accounts. Her game plan was exactly the way she played it out. Get some distance, get some time, get your own money coming in, and then fade him out. 
and that's what she did. And that's a painful thing because it gave him a lot of time to start plotting and thinking about what he was going to do. In desperation, Snyder flew to Vancouver. He came unannounced and he was acting as if everything was okay and nothing was wrong with the relationship. He wanted to take her out to a club and it turns out that what he really had in mind was having her sign autographs so that he could make money. And she did it reluctantly, but, but she always did that, I suppose, to keep him at bay. Dorothy was not just a wife. Dorothy was a ticket to something that he wanted. It was a connection with Hollywood. It was a connection with Playboy. It was a connection with celebrity. And all of that disappeared when the relationship with, with Peter began. In June of 1980, Dorothy had returned to New York to finish filming They All Laughed. Paul Snyder dispatched two friends to spy on his wife. Paul tried to keep tabs on her. I know he did, but it wasn't out of, I don't think, jealousy. It was protecting his interest. Snyder's worst fears were confirmed when they reported that Dorothy was spending her nights in Bogdanovich's hotel room. A few days later, Snyder was dealt another blow when he appeared at the Playboy Mansion, only to be turned away at the gate. That was one of the big points in the deterioration of Paul Schneider, because he thought he and Hefner were so tight. It was definitely a profound psychological change in him when he was no longer welcome at the mansion. Ten days later, on July 30th, 1980, Dorothy Stratton and Peter Bogdanovich returned to Los Angeles. Paul Snyder was waiting for them. And he said he had gone over to Bogdanovich's house and was waiting for him, and he never showed up, so he just fired two rounds at his house. He was waiting in the bushes that night. It was only afterward that we figured out that he'd already bought a gun and was threatening to kill everybody. He blamed Bogdanovich for taking his wife away, but he couldn't get to Peter. I think in his world, Hefner and Bogdanovich were like gods that walked the earth. You know, the walls to Peter's mansion were just as high as the ones at the Playboy Mansion. He couldn't get over either one. On Wednesday, August 13th, Marilyn Grabowski invited Dorothy to have lunch with her on the Sunset Strip. And we're sitting there and she said, I've got to go see Paul and tell him that I'm living with Peter. And I went, wow, boy, this was, this was pretty fast. But thinking of her words and how she was acting, Paul was already someone in her past. Paul didn't exist for her present, and she made that change like that. The next morning, Thursday, August 14th, Dorothy woke up at Peter Bogdanovich's house. In the morning when she left to go, she didn't tell me she was going to see him. She was going to see her lawyer, she told me, and then she had a shoot at Playboy. She was very edgy and very nervous, and I was um, very unhappy that she was leaving. We didn't really have a good parting. We were going to go to Paul's. I said, you know what, maybe I won't go to the beach. And she dropped me off, and... Uh, she promised me that she'd pick me up at 2 o'clock, and I was waiting. At 12.30 p.m., Dorothy Stratton arrived at the house she had once shared with her husband. She knew she had to deal with this guy, and he was threatening her, threatening to kill all of us. And that's why she went over. I knew that he was capable of violence. I just felt it was going to end badly. I think she felt guilty because she was having an affair with... Bogdanovich, I think she felt that she owed him. She owed it to him to see him in person. Things will change for me. No. Why, you mean maybe I'll grow up to be a big movie director? Or own a big magazine? Is that what you mean? Maybe then I could get you back. Is that what you're saying? Sit down. <laughs> and I'm sure she probably came there with an absolute dead emotional heart. Just, I feel sorry for this guy, and, you know, to not be loved, but pitied. That's an emotion I'm sure he could not control. You're watching this thing unfold in front of you, and you know it's not, uh, it's not going to be good. On August 14th, 1980, Dorothy Stratton went to see her husband, Paul Snyder, to tell him that she wanted a divorce. Her lover, Peter Bogdanovich, had no idea where she had gone. And she just didn't come back. 
She didn't come back for hours. And I was very nervous and didn't know what was going on. And I waited and waited and waited. And, and she never came at 10 o'clock at night. Peter was concerned. Everybody was concerned. I knew where she went. When Louise said that she'd gone over to see Snyder, um, a kind of spear went through my heart of fear. Can you hear me? They did this. Playboy Magazine's 1980 Playmate of the Year has been found shot to death, killed apparently by her estranged husband, who then killed himself. Dorothy and Paul's nude bodies were discovered by Snyder's housemates at 11 p.m. She had been shot in the face with a 12-gauge shotgun. There were bloody handprints on her and strands of her hair stuck in medical tape on the sexual bondage chair Paul had in his bedroom. Paul's body was lying on top of the gun. No one heard the shots over the rush of the freeway behind the house. Then a phone call came in and informed me that Dorothy had been murdered. It was very unreal. And uh, I, the first order of business obviously was to call Peter and tell him. Well, that was the darkest moment in my life. And uh, sort of like being hit over the head, sort of like having an A-bomb explode at your feet and somehow you don't die. I lost a sister, but really, um, a best friend, and felt like if I had gone that day with her, that maybe she would be here. On August 19, 1980, Dorothy Stratton was laid to rest at Westwood Memorial Cemetery. She was 20 years old. Grief-stricken over the death of his girlfriend, director Peter Bogdanovich was now faced with the agonizing task of finishing his film that featured her in a co-starring role. It was tough. I remember my fists were clenched most of the time. He disappeared in the editing room for many, many months. And what it must have been like for him to be editing while trying to deal with the tragedy of her death. It's almost impossible to imagine. I think he went a little crazy. I kind of kept it together and really didn't go to therapy, didn't do anything, and didn't really do much, and sort of fell apart completely five years later. They All Laughed came out in 1981. It was not a hit. Bogdanovich made frequent trips to Vancouver to see Dorothy's family and spent four years writing a book about her life. Dorothy's life story was brought back into the limelight in 1983 with the release of Star 80, starring Mariel Hemingway and Eric Roberts. And again a year later when Peter Bogdanovich's book The Killing of the Unicorn came out. The book unleashed a torrent of finger pointing between the author and Hugh Hefner who Bogdanovich blamed for Dorothy's downfall. Excerpts from the book were published in newspapers across the country and around the world and produced the stress that, that led eventually to a, a stroke in the, in the early, early 1985. After the stroke, I realized that keeping quiet about it was the very thing that was causing the problems, and I spoke out about what was really going on. And today is the truth as far as you're concerned? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Hugh Hefner says that three and a half weeks ago, he suffered a stroke. A stroke he blames on Peter Bogdanovich, whose book charges that Hefner seduced Dorothy Stratton and lured her into a sordid playboy world that she secretly hated. And she fell into the uh, manner of playing a happy playboy girl very well because she's a brilliant actress. Dorothy loved playboy. Dorothy's tragic death was motivated not in any way by her association with Playboy, but clearly by the breakup of her marriage because of the affair with Peter Bogdanovich. Hefner went on to accuse Bogdanovich of having sexual relations with Dorothy's 16-year-old sister, Louise. 
And I must say, in Peter's defense, as much as one can, I think that it was the action of an obsessed and sick human being. I think that the pursuit of the teenage sister was an attempt, in a bizarre way, to capture Dorothy, who was gone. The bitter battle concerning murdered playmate Dorothy Stratton is going to the courts. Stratton's mother and sister have filed a $5 million lawsuit against Hugh Hefner. Hefner claimed director Peter Bogdanovich was sexually involved with a teenage girl after her sister's death. She says that's not so and is suing for libel. It's absolutely false. He's been a friend. Friend. Nothing more. Nothing more. To go then and have a news conference and to make such a statement, I think, is really, really outrageous and, and I think does justify a high award in a court of law. He brought suit against me for libel, but he did it in Louise's name. As soon as the depositions began, it became clear he was culpable and the suit were dropped. The things about the book that were controversial unfortunately outweighed the the impact of the portrait on her and uh, of her and I regretted that I think Peter deep down you know felt tremendously guilty he'd either failed to protect Dorothy in one case or he had been the proximate cause of her husband killing her in the other emotionally drained from the lawsuit and financially drained from buying back the rights to they all laughed Peter Bogdanovich buckled under the strain of holding on to Dorothy's legacy by the mid-80s, he had declared bankruptcy and gone into seclusion. In her lifetime, Dorothy Stratton was the girl whose identity was shaped and defined by the powerful people around her. In death, she would exert a kind of power over them that would never go away. I don't know that any of us have ever really made a peace with it. So often, the story ends with the death of the protagonist. But in the case of Dorothy Stratton, the saga continued. In fact, she is now remembered more for her death than her life. And the scandal of her murder became a harbinger of a new era in which the decadence of the 70s would no longer be in vogue. She was murdered at the end of a, a, a rather magic decade. And it was the beginning of a very dark decade. It was certainly the darkest decade for me personally. But it was a very difficult decade politically, socially, sexually. Peter Bogdanovich would try to find his way out of the darkness by pursuing a romance with Louise Stratton, the younger sister of his murdered girlfriend. And he was really there for me and some sort of connection I had with him. And he um, became a lot of roles in my life. It seemed natural to uh, gravitate toward Dorothy's sister. It didn't seem unusual. We both felt blasted, so we kind of helped each other. That grew to be a, a, another kind of love. He was a father to her, he was a brother to her, he was an uncle to her. He was all these things. But I always said to Louise, remember, you're yourself. Don't try to be something you're not. And don't let anybody make you think that you're somebody you're not. On December 30th, 1988, 49-year-old Peter Bogdanovich married 20-year-old Louise Stratton at a Vancouver hotel. Her mother, Nellie Hoogstraten, heard the news only after the fact. She said, now I've lost two daughters. I think she was in the shadow of Dorothy and in the shadow of me. And uh, I think in, it, it made it difficult for her in a way and ultimately difficult for both of us. And she has to find herself. I felt so much survivor's guilt. So I struggled a long time and uh, finally came out through the other side. Finally. In 2001, after a 13-year marriage that few understood, Louise Stratton filed for divorce from Peter Bogdanovich. And quite out of the blue, Louise contacted me in the last two, three years and told me how sorry she was about everything that had happened, how much she cared about me, how much she knew Dorothy cared about me. I think that for Louise, completing that connection with me and with Playboy was something that she needed very much because of the loss of Dorothy. Keep pushing your arms in. Would you like to be just like your sister when you grow up? Yeah. Why? Because I'm proud of her. You do that to me, is it? 
I feel her presence every day. And there's not a day that goes by that I don't think of her or have her pass through my mind or hear her laugh. All I can say is that she touched me so many ways and, and I'm so happy that she was my sister, so. She's had a profound influence on my life and I don't think that that is a small thing to have a profound influence on a few people's lives. But certainly everyone who knew her was changed by her. It is hard to digest because it's ugly and it's real and it's sad. And what ends up happening is because they both died unnecessarily, it ends up being kind of pointless in that there are no winners. I mean, you see it every day in Hollywood. You see these young girls coming and revealing every part of their bodies and doing everything they can do to get seen, to get their 15 minutes of fame, thinking that it's going to last maybe a whole hour. And it doesn't. Dorothy Stratton's 15 minutes didn't last long enough to know if she would have lived up to the potential that people saw in her. But her own plans for the future were always very simple. When I'm 60, um, I have hoped to have accomplished a, a good family life with children and uh, have had the pleasure of just doing what I wanted to do all my life. Well, good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.